Well, hello, everybody. Uh, good evening, good morning, good afternoon. Uh, welcome to this uh, LSE uh, event organized by the Department of International Relations here uh, at the school. Let me first introduce myself. My name is uh, Professor Michael Cox. Uh, I'm Emeritus Professor of International Relations at the LSE and a founding director of LSE Ideas, uh, which is the LSE's foreign policy think tank. A welcome to all of you, and there's a very large number of you out there. Uh, certainly welcome to our three distinguished speakers uh, tonight, and I'm sure we're going to have a fantastic discussion over the next uh, hour and a half. Plenty of time for them to speak, some time for me to interrogate all three of them, a little bit of time for them to have a conversation between themselves, and then we'll move over to you and have, I think, uh, an, an excellent debate on this fantastically important topic. It couldn't be more important. World on the edge, the crisis of the Western liberal order. Some years ago, Beata Jan, our speaker for this evening from Sussex University said, and I quote you, Beata, despite the hegemonic position of liberalism, after the end of the Cold War, liberal foreign policies like democracy promotion, humanitarian intervention, and neoliberal economic policies widely failed to achieve their aims. You said that, by the way, eight years ago. John Eikenberry, you said in 2018, and this is not a question, for seven decades, the world has been dominated by a Western liberal order. And you said in international affairs, today, this liberal international order is in crisis. And last, but by no means least, my old friend from Chicago, John Mearsheimer, you said, John, in 2019, I quote, I hope accurately, it was clear by 2019 that the liberal international order was in deep trouble. The tectonic plates that underpin it are shifting. And you said that little could be done to repair and rescue it. So each of the three speakers has a clear view that there is a crisis, though I, I suspect that all three will have different views as to whether it can be overcome or how it can be overcome. So those are the introductions. I don't need to go into all of the speakers here, only to say the Beata Jan is at Sussex University, as I mentioned earlier on, and has wrote, wrote a book many years, some time ago, called Liberal Internationalism. John Eikenberry's recent book is called A World Safe for Democracy. And John Mearsheimer's last book is called The Great Delusion, Liberal Dreams and International Reality. So I don't think we can have three better speakers to reflect on this large question uh, this evening. The running order for this evening is going to, I'm going to start with John Eikenberry, and then going to move on to John Mearsheimer, and uh, then Beata will, I hope, come up with some criticisms of probably both of them. And I, we look forward to, to that. So with no further ado, I'm going to hand over to John Eikenberry, dear friend from Princeton, to reflect on the liberal order today and where you think it's gone wrong, John, and how you think we might get out of it. John, over to you. Thank you, Mick, and thank you, everyone, for joining us. It's a great honor to be on this panel with Beata and with uh, John, uh, who are dear friends and colleagues, and it's a, it's a joy to, to, uh, to reflect on this big topic together with them. I agree, uh, Mick, I think there's wide um, consensus that the US-led international liberal order is in crisis. Uh, this 75-year-old order has been called many things, Pax Americana, the Western order, the free world, uh, the G7 world. Uh, someone described it as Pax uh, Democratica. Uh, uh, a few years ago, uh, uh, Dan Dudney and I uh, I, I, we're told coined the term liberal international order in an article in 1999. Whatever its name, it seems to be at a crossroads, uh, a kind of world historical moment. The, the, the global order uh, is, is in a kind of fluid condition, uh, lots of possibilities. It looks like a, a kind of historic moment uh, uh, for, for these kinds of debates and for the real world as it unfolds. Basic questions are being asked. What are the sources of of international order, 
Uh, can liberal democracies uh, make a comeback? Uh, can capitalism and democracy be reconciled? Uh, what is the future of liberal internationalism? Uh, this cooperative organization of the global system led by liberal democracies. My first move, and I make this argument in my new book, is to take the long view of the liberal international project, which is as much a story of struggle and challenge as it is of triumph. Liberal order did not begin in 1989, nor really even in 1945. The, really, the, the story of liberal internationalism and the struggle over building a, a world safe for liberal democracies began at least 200 years ago. Um, and it's gone through extraordinary uh, 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 shifts and, and transformations, golden eras and crises, deep contestation, close run things. Arthur Schlesinger wrote a piece in Foreign Affairs at the end of the 20th century and said that that century really was one where liberal democracy survived by the skin of its teeth. There are really moments when uh, you, you could argue that the world was, was poised to move in a very different direction. Read Ira Katz Nelson's book, Desolation and Enlightenment, a book about liberals trying to reconstruct their project of open societies in an open international order after 1945 in their own generation facing uh, an extraordinary avalanche of crises, the Great Depression, the rise of totalitarianism, of fascism, of total war, of the Holocaust, and the dropping of the atomic bomb. And yet that generation of liberals found ways to pick themselves up and to reimagine and to reimagine liberal order for a new era. But doing so with a, a kind of world weary sense that uh, one needs to think of the liberal project as one uh, surviving, if it does, in a very agonistic world in which uh, challenges are never banished and wh where it's always uh, uh, an ongoing effort to, 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 uh, to build and rebuild uh, your open society. Obviously, the liberal international order, as it's been handed down over the last seven decades, is, is troubled and under attack, not least by those inside of it. Uh, the American president, I think, was truly uh, came to office with the idea that liberal international order was something that he, that he opposed and he wanted to try to disassemble. And he made good efforts at doing so. But also beyond, beyond that, beyond Trump, uh, the kind of uh, weakening of internationalism, broadly speaking, in the Western world, certainly, certainly in the United States. This uh, has many sources, of course, but in the more recent period, the Iraq war, the 2008 financial crisis, both of these have weakened international elites on the left and on the right, and the liberal bet, that is to say the view in the 1990s that China could be invited into a kind of liberal order, an expanding order, and it would become a stakeholder and uh, move in various ways uh, towards liberal democracy. This too failed to happen, and it too discredited the larger project in, in various quarters. My argument is that you have to push back, that the story is more than that, that it, the liberal order is not simply, as, as those on the right would say, a kind of illusion, a kind of, uh, it's all about power, and those on the left who would say it's all about social injustice and, and oppression. There is a record to be defended. And I think you do have to begin with 1945, the, the building by multiple states, not just the United States, of a, a partner with partners far reaching, complex system of, of relations uh, uh, beyond anything that had been, been uh, attempted uh, previously. It was a new kind of order, a global order with regional institutions, economic, political security, partnerships, alliances, shared values, strategic alignments of various sorts. And it created a kind of world system, a, a kind of framework in which states starting with liberal democracies could tie themselves to this this, this order for mutual advancement. It's a, it's a liberal international project with, with a set of core assumptions that openness, exchange, properly managed is good for all parties concerned, that institutions um, uh, facilitate cooperation, uh, that liberal democracies have a, a distinctive uh, capacity and set of values and interests that would lead them to want to uh, collaborate uh, in special ways to create a higher level order that isn't simply the balance of power or empire. Uh, and then finally, in an era of rising, even cascading economic and security and 
and uh, environmental interdependence, it's better to work together. You can't be secure alone. You can only be secure uh, uh, together. Those four convictions are, are longstanding. They come out of the 19th century across our different eras of, of, uh, of ups and downs uh, of order and disorder. And it's created in this more modern period a set of accomplishments that I think we shouldn't forget before we write our obituaries to, to the liberal order. It was in this era with these states, with these ideas, uh, who uh, provided a basis for uh, reopening the world economy, creating a golden era of growth and uh, of trade and investment, number one. Number two, a framework for reintegrating Germany and Japan, making them uh, in a position to be the second and third largest economies for many decades and creating incentives and capacities for them to be civilian great powers without nuclear weapons, which is quite extraordinary. Germany and France launched a period of reconciliation, uh, uh, burying old hatreds, launching the European Union, and then the larger set of, uh, of liberal democracies, all of them, it's often forgotten during this period, in this order, reinvented themselves as social democracies. In Germany, the social market, in Britain, in France, uh, in the United States, in Japan, these countries made transitions from older uh, laissez-faire kinds of societies into modern ones. The trilateral world created new institutions. And then we have uh, the new generation of states that made transitions into this order. So there's an extraordinary record. Uh, and China itself has had under the auspices of what we call Pax Americana, its best decades in two millennia. So there is a, a story of an order that has functioned, uh, arguably creating the most successful international order in history, measured in terms of the generation of wealth, the provision of security, and a glimmering of social justice. Now, the question is, what went wrong. And, and that would be where I would leave my last remarks. I would say, in many ways, it's a story of, of the uh, liberal order being a victim of its own success. Uh, uh, we, 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 in some sense, can argue, and I, we may agree on part of this, uh, uh, John and I might, that there was a kind of expansion, a kind of explosion of this order after the end of the Cold War. It, the inside order, the order that was created after 1945 inside of the bipolar system, uh, a liberal order with these features I've described, uh, in some sense, then became the only order standing. And by default, it became the, the centerpiece, the core for states uh, trying to glob onto it, to expand, to, to find uh, opportunities to join. Uh, so the free world market, uh, mutual aid society characteristics of this inside order uh, expanded and various features of it eroded. Um, uh, in some ways, the, my core argument really is that there was in the, uh, the most developed form of liberal order a kind of logic of conditionality. To be inside was to buy into a suite of obligations and responsibilities uh, to get in return rights and opportunities and capacities, um, uh, a, a, a kind of club, if you will. And this club character broke down uh, in the 90s and after the liberal order became more like a shopping mall where anybody could walk in and uh, connect to a particular part of it, gain something, but not, again, to, to buy into the larger suite of responsibilities. The logic of conditionality was lost. So I would just end by saying, um, uh, I think that those who think there is still a future for a liberal order are going to have to think both in smaller terms, but also in more uh, pragmatic terms of, of circling the wagons to some extent, going back to basic principles, that, uh, that there is a, a, a core set of countries that have to be reconstructed to drive in a, a, a regime, a, a, a reform agenda for, for, uh, for rethinking the various regimes of, of the, the global order, but to do so with the idea that, that this will never be the, the only task of rebuilding international order after this moment of crisis, that it will have to be simultaneously uh, an effort to, to engage and find ways to, to live with, uh, to stabilize relations, not just inside of the liberal democratic world, but with those on the outside that, that in many ways do not wish well uh, this liberal order.
So you have to, in some sense, play the double game of, of reimagining uh, how liberal democracies, who will be uh, uh, remain so uh, as, as, as great as 70% of world GNP, they are still uh, capable, properly organized, to be a kind of critical mass for the larger world order. And the message really that uh, liberal democracies need to, to give to each other uh, is that, that in many ways, uh, without that kind of cooperation, they are going to uh, uh, evolve uh, themselves into a world that's going to be much, much less hospitable to liberal democratic values that, that, they, that they hold dear, that they should take a, a, a leaf from the, the argument made by Benjamin Franklin right at the point of the American uh, colonies making their bid for independence when he said, um, we will certainly uh, need to hang together, or if we don't, we will surely hang separately. And that message is just as relevant today. Okay, thank you uh, very much, John. I'm now going to pass over to John Mearsheimer. John Mearsheimer, I'd ask you to get off mute if you could, so we can hear you. Thanks very much, John. Well, I'll hand over to you and look forward to what you have to say. Liberalism, a victim of its own success. Discuss. Over to you, John. Thank you very much, Mick. It's a pleasure to be here with you, Beata, and John. And uh, I look forward to the discussion we'll have after everybody's done talking. Uh, as I'm sure most people in the audience know, in the early 1990s, after the Cold War had ended and the Soviet Union had collapsed, there was a huge amount of optimism in the air regarding the liberal international order. And in fact, John Eikenberry wrote what I consider to be his seminal book, After Victory, that basically argued that we had found the magic formula for making the liberal international order work for almost ever and ever. Uh, but obviously uh, something happened along the way and the liberal international order went south. And the question on the table really is what happened here? How did we go from this period of profound optimism to this period of profound pessimism? What went wrong? And what does that tell us about where we're headed? Uh, I wanna start by defining what I mean by the liberal international order. And I first want to define the word order, then international, then liberal, because I think it's very important that we understand what this uh, animal really is all about. Uh, when I talk about an order, I'm talking about a group of international institutions that work together, okay, to help govern the international system, to help govern relations between states. And as I'm sure most of you know, international institutions are rules. They're rules that help states conduct their business. So when you talk about an order as a conglomeration of institutions, you're talking about a web of rules that help states interact with each other. When we talk about the Western order during the Cold War, we're talking about institutions like NATO, the IMF, the World Bank, and so forth and so on. Those were all rules, and they were all designed to help the countries in the Western orbit operate with each other. So that's what an order is. In my opinion, an international order is an order that includes all of the great powers at a minimum, and in an ideal world would include every country on the planet. But to be an international order, it has to include all the great powers. A liberal international order is one where the leading great power or great powers is or are a liberal democracy. In other words, for an international order to be liberal, in my story, it has to be headed by a liberal state. And to be more specific, it has to be a unipolar system. In my view, you can only have a liberal international order when you have a hegemon that is a liberal state, which of course was true with the United States during the unipolar moment. And be that's because 
the unipolar state doesn't have to worry about balanced power politics. Realism or great power politics gets taken off the table and that liberal unipole is free to pursue a policy that's based on liberalism. And that's how you get a liberal international order. Now, when I think about the history of the liberal international order, and here's where John and I disagree, John dates it to at least 1945. And he sees the liberal order pretty much running from 1945 up to the present. I believe that the liberal international order was created roughly in 1990 when we moved into a unipolar world. Again, as I said earlier, for me, you need unipolarity to have a liberal international order. And I do not believe that you had a liberal international order during the Cold War. It was neither international nor liberal. What you had during the Cold War were two bounded orders. You had an order that was dominated by the Soviet Union on one side that included uh, institutions like the Warsaw Pact and so forth and so on. And you had a Western bound order that was dominated by the United States that included institutions like NATO and the EU and so forth and so on. So you had these two orders, a Western order and a Soviet dominated order that were designed in good part to wage security competition. It was not a liberal international order. Those were realist orders to the core. What happens in 1989 with the end of the, so uh, the Cold War and then certainly in 1991 with the collapse of the Soviet Union is that the Western order wins and the Soviet-led order loses. And what the winners decide to do is take that Western bound order, that bounded order in the West, and move it all across the planet and turn it into a liberal international order. And it's that order, right, that is now in the process of collapsing. It's not the order that existed during the Cold War or I should say the orders that existed during the Cold War. One of them collapsed and the other one was then expanded in the early 90s. And that's the one that is now collapsing. Now, the question is what went wrong? Uh, actually in the 1990s, it looked like people like John Eikenberry were geniuses and the world was operating exactly the way they said it was gonna work. Uh, and even in the early 2000s, things were moving along quite swimmingly. Then things began to go south. And 2016, of course, was the big year, because as you all know, in 2016, not only did you have Brexit, but Donald Trump was elected president of the United States. Uh, it's very important to understand that when Donald Trump ran as president in 2016, he ran explicitly against the liberal international order. He loathed the, international, the liberal international order. And very importantly, he was elected. And one of the reasons, not the only reason by any means, but one of the reasons that he was elected is that many Americans recognized that the liberal international order had failed and they were willing to put him in power. And by the way, he would have been reelected in 2020 had we not had COVID because it's not like lots of Americans now have decided they want to bring back the liberal international order. So what went wrong here? Three things really mattered. Number one was the rise of China. It's hard to believe this, but the liberal internationalists who built this liberal international order actually helped China grow into a potential peer competitor of the United States. This is truly remarkable. The idea that the United States of America has helped create a potential peer competitor. Do you think Britain would have helped turn Germany into a potential peer competitor before World War I? In fact, the British wanted to do everything they possibly could to prevent Germany from becoming a potential peer competitor. But the United States turned China into a potential peer competitor. But the end result of that is that we transcended unipolarity. We're now actually in a multipolar world because as you all know, Putin also resurrected Russian power. So we now have three great powers on the planet. We're in a multipolar world. We're no longer in unipolarity. And as I said to you folks before, you have to be in a unipolar world and you have to have a liberal unipole to have a liberal international order. And now what you have is a multipolar world. 
where great power politics are back on the table, which is another way of saying we've moved back into a realist world and therefore the liberal international order is kaput. Second point I would make about why the liberal international order failed is that uh, the Unipol and its allies, especially its Western European allies, uh, decided that they were gonna run around the world and try and turn every country into a liberal democracy. Uh, and this ran into really big trouble. The most important point you wanna keep in mind here is that nationalism is the most powerful political ideology on the planet. And at the core of nationalism is the concept of sovereignty. And the fact is that states don't like other states coming into their country and telling them how they should run their politics. As many of you know, the United States goes ballistic at the mere thought that the Russians may have interfered in the 2016 presidential election. Well, what's good for the goose is good for the gander. And don't you think the Russians and the Chinese and the Iraqis and all sorts of other countries around the world don't want the United States sticking its nose in their business and telling them what kind of political system they should have? The answer to that is yes, right? So the United States gets in the business of trying to turn China into a liberal democracy and trying to turn Russia into a liberal democracy, trying to affect a color revolution in Russia. Do you think the Russians are gonna be happy about this? Do you think the Chinese are gonna be happy about this? I can guarantee you they're not. They're sovereign nation states. So what happens is relations between Russia and the United States and China and the United States poison because we're trying to turn them into liberal democracies. And then there are the smaller countries around the world where the United States thinks it can create democracies at the end of a rifle barrel. So we end up with the Bush doctrine invading all sorts of countries in the Middle East and doing all sorts of things to turn them into liberal democracies. This, as you all well know, is a fiasco. We end up being responsible for a huge amount of death and destruction in the greater Middle East. And what do we have to show for it? Nothing but failure. Look at the Afghanistan war. It's the longest war in American history. The longest war in American history. And all we're doing is delaying the inevitable, which is defeat, right? So we failed. So the spread of democracy failed. Then finally, you get globalization, uh, economic globalization. And there's no question, lots of people got wealthy as a result of globalization. Come to the United States. We have this upper crust of people who got filthy rich. The problem is it didn't do a lot of good for people in the middle class and certainly in the lower classes. We have tremendous economic inequality in the United States. And of course the elites, they love globalization and then they love the liberal international order and they hate to see it go away. But the fact is more Americans than you can count want to do away with the liberal international order. And they like Donald Trump's ideas. Remember Donald Trump, he hated institutions, right? He hated the liberal international order. He hated the open international economy, right? People voted for him. It's just a tremendous amount of dissatisfaction. So all the economic policies that were associated with uh, uh, the uh, liberal international order uh, worked to cause a lot of disaffection in countries like the United States and in countries like Britain as well. Uh, so these three factors helped undermine the system uh, that was set up, in my opinion, not in 1945, but in the early 1990s. Let me conclude by saying a word or two about where we are headed. Uh, I think there's no possibility of resurrecting the liberal international order for no other reason that the US-China competition is going to dominate international politics for the rest of this century. And that competition is going to be a realist competition at its core. What you're gonna get are two bounded orders, just like you had during the Cold War that dominate the politics of the planet. You're gonna have an American-led bounded order on one side and a Chinese-led bounded order on the other side. And they are going to be the two principal orders on the planet. And they're going to be realist orders. And in that world, there is no room for a liberal international order. And in my opinion, that's all for the good because that liberal international order was doomed to fail from the start. Thank you. Thanks very much, John, for a very different perspective, obviously.
And uh, last but by no means least, my friend Beata from Sussex, who's going to reflect on our two speakers and obviously say her own words and bring forth her own theories and views as to where she thinks the crisis came from and where you think it might be going to. Beata, over to you. Thank you very much for the invitation, Mick. And, and John, and John, really nice to see you again, if only online. Um, and it's always great to sort of catch up with this conversation that goes along with the political developments. Uh, so it's going to be an interesting discussion. Um, why is the liberal world order in crisis? I think in both uh, the realist and liberal answers that we've just heard, uh, policy choices at the end of the Cold War play quite an important role. Um, they lead to domestic and international overreach in some uh, form. But what these answers miss, I think, are the deeper roots of, this, uh, of these policies in the contradictions of liberalism itself. And those con contradictions, I will argue, prevent a, a return to the sort of good old days of the Cold War. I'm going to make this uh, case in four points. My first point is that logically, the liberal world order must be implicated in the current crisis. If liberal world order means not so different from what John Mearsheimer says, refers to a world in which liberal structures, institutions, and principles are dominant and shape the political dynamics. And we usually are, are associate three pillars with these, um, with these principles, an economic pillar, that's the liberal capitalist economy, world economy, a political pillar, uh, liberal democracy as the uh, hegemonic political regime, and an ideological uh, pillar, human rights, individual rights, international law, and these kinds of things. So in this sense, uh, the end of the Cold War did, I think, usher in a liberal world order. But if we find uh, rising nationalism, rising populism, a rising opposition to liberal principles, policies, and institutions in the context of such a liberal world order, then um, the development, that development has by definition uh, been facilitated by these liberal structures. But my second point is that liberalism does not just provide a structural context uh, within which liberal, illiberal forces are gaining weight. It's also responsible for the very policies that have triggered this populist backlash. So for example, ne uh, neoliberal economic policies promise general prosperity. And as John Mirsham has already mentioned now, what they actually produced is economic crises, obscene amounts of inequality, the dismantling of uh, welfare states, the exporting of jobs, privatization of uh, education, healthcare, and so on. Political democracy also promises self-determination, but when it is imposed from the outside, whether that's by diplomatic, economic, or military means, it actually amounts to a denial of political freedom for the people affected by it. And even within mature liberal states, I would say, democracy did not actually provide the means to address uh, pressing problems. On the contrary, while society was becoming ever more divided into winners and losers of the system, the traditional big parties all hugged the center and did not actually offer any alternatives. Instead, people were constantly being told there is no alternative, we have to submit to the natural forces of the global economy and democracy was not uh, floated as something that could do anything about this. And then we can point to similar uh, contradictions uh, in liberal ideology where human rights uh, were used on the one hand to justify military interventions in other states and were blithely violated by liberal states themselves on the other hand. So the second point I'm making is that the liberal world order provided not only the context but also the provocation for populist policies, as, as in some ways uh, both John's also recognize. But now I'm going to really depart from them because my third point is that these contradictions are not just the result of policy mistakes that were made after the end of the Cold War, but actually definitive of liberalism itself. 
Capitalism produces inequality. Not even liberal economists are going to question that ever. It's based on progressive uh, privatization and expropriation of land, of resources, of labor, of knowledge, and so on. And this inevitably produces winners and losers. And liberalism has always dealt with this problem um, by using the domestic international divide to, to uh, separate the winner, winners from the losers, the dark side from the light side of liberal policies by extending political rights in the domestic sphere and, for example, denying them to uh, colonial populations, or by establishing welfare states in the domestic sphere while pursuing uh, brutal exploitation abroad. And even after decolonization, by protecting domestic farmers and demanding that poorer countries open up their markets, or by respecting democratic uh, elections in rich liberal states, but not in Iran or Gaza or by using the ICC to indict Africans while refusing its authority over their own soldiers. So these contradictions are part of the entire history of liberalism, and it's always managed them by importing economic benef benefits from abroad and exporting political conflict into the international sphere. And these inequalities were justified by ideologies of nationalism, racism, civilizational and developmental superiority and so on. Now, obviously these distinctions uh, were never particularly neat. There has always been privatization and expropriation, political emancipation and political oppression in the domestic and the international sphere. But by projecting the brunt of expropriation and oppression into the international sphere and by providing some uh, measure of mitigation of its fallout in the domestic sphere, liberalism was able to say, look, we can produce general prosperity, we can produce political freedom, we can produce respect for human rights and international cooperation and peaceful conflict resolution and all of these things. You just have to look at the US or European states. They're not quite there yet, but very close and we're getting there. And if it does not work, in the third world, that's their fault. It's their lack of good governance, their traditional cultures, and so on. And this brings me to my last point. The significance of the end of the Cold War to the, uh, for the current crisis does not just lie in facilitating counterproductive policies like missionary democracy promotion, although it clearly did that too. The deeper significance of the end of the Cold War is that it undermined the separation between the domestic and the international sphere. It led to the globalization of liberal principles, practices, and institutions. And with that, the dark side of liberalism came home to roost. Now, instead of importing economic benefits from the international sphere, people experience the export of investment and jobs and the dismantling of welfare states at home. Now, Migrants and refugees are experienced as importing political conflict from abroad. Now, liberal ideologies of nationalism, racism, and so on come under human rights scrutiny. In other words, in a liberal world order, there is no outside to project power politics and exploitation into, and there is no other that can be blamed for these shortcomings. So when populist movements today want to build walls, make America great again, take back control, ban travel, and so on. What they're doing is they're trying to reinstate the domestic international divide that is associated with a comparatively good life in the past. And this problem, I think, um, in conclusion, is not going to be addressed by either the liberal or the realist uh, proposals. Apart from um, abandoning missionary democracy promotion, on which I think we all, we all agree, um, an important pillar of John Eikenberry's solution is, or at least was the last time I looked more closely, uh, a fairer and more distributive social order, basically more social democracy. But this overlooks that it was precisely that social democratic approach that has sold out to neoliberalism those very parties that are systematically losing support. So who is going to rein in the Gateses and the Zuckerbergs and the Bezoses of this world? And 
John Mearsheimer meanwhile puts his faith in a return uh, to multipolar balance of power politics. But this overlooks that if the Cold War provided incentives for social and political cooperation and cohesion, it was because the Soviet Union offered a competing social system, socialism, and therefore presented the double threat of war and revolution. And to counter that threat, liberal states had to make sure that the majority of the population actually benefited from the capitalist system and was ready to defend it. But today, Russia and China do not offer a competing social system, at least not one that is in any way attractive. And so there is no external pressure to appease and co-opt large parts of the population. So there's no going back to the good old days of the Cold War, which of course were not so good in any case for everyone, because the success of liberalism has undermined the political and social foundations on which those days were based. While multipolarity can restrain liberalism abroad, it cannot actually provide the social glue at home. Thank you. Uh, Beata, thank you very much. Uh, conclusion to three fantastic presentations. Before I move on to the many questions we're already getting from around the world, you won't be surprised to hear. I'm going to ask each of you in turn, not exactly to reply to, you know, to your, to your competitors, if I might use that phrase, or your colleagues, but maybe to answer one question, which I want to put to you, uh, by somebody who clearly was not a liberal, and I think his name was V.I. Lenin. And Lenin asked that question, um, what is to be done? I mean, it seems to me that all three of you have outlined in different ways, and brilliantly, if I might also add, what the problem is and where we are now. Although you've all arrived at very different conclusions with some different premises as well, without doubt. But what do you think is going to be done? For instance, if I start with you, John Eikenberry, and then move on to John Mearsheim and then to Beata. You've all provided me with brilliant analyses, different, but what is to be done as Leonard Stuart dealer? Where do we go from here? Do we simply accept that the liberal order has failed, as John Mearsheimer said? Do we move back to a form of reformed social democracy, which Beata says is going to be impossible? Or do we simply accept that the world is in a process of early disintegration and the outcome of all this is going to be pretty awful? Um, John Eikenberry, let me start with you, then move over to John from Chicago, and then, as I call, Beata from Sussex. John Eikenberry. Yeah, it's a great, great question, uh, big question. And uh, I, I, in some ways, um, the, um, the question that Lenin poses is, 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 is the right one. And, the, and my response would be, uh, what do you want to defend? Uh, we've got uh, eight more decades in the 21st century. What, what are we, how do we want to, to see this century unfold? What at the end of the century, what do we want our grandchildren to, to have as values and institutions so that they can prepare themselves for the 22nd century? Uh, what, what do we want to have survive amidst this crisis? I would say we want liberal democracy uh, and certain values that are embedded in it, uh, uh, rule of law, freedom of speech, uh, toleration, uh, openness, uh, the, the, the core values of open societies. And, uh, and so I, I think uh, the, the agenda for our generation is to try to defend those values and those institutions, uh, to, to, to find a pathway for, of reform uh, uh, in the liberal democratic world, to regain our footing, to address the, the deep disparities, the inequalities, and to note that we've done it before uh, the New Deal was really about trying to save liberal democracy, and uh, Franklin Roosevelt was saw the international challenges as not simply security balancing, as John Mearsheimer has suggested, but finding a way to re reconstruct a liberal democratic world that couldn't be done on a country-to-country -country basis. It had to be a kind of conglomeration of countries that created a critical mass and shared capacities to survive themselves, to, to manage themselves, to reconstruct a, a liberal democracy. And Beata is, is absolutely right that liberal democracy is an easy target for the punching bag of rhetoric. It's full of contradictions, but that's what liberal democracy is. It's trying to si simultaneously have a society that val valorizes liberty and equality. Think about that. 
What other social system tries to uh, pull that trick off? Or individualism and community? Or sovereignty and interdependence? So we are fated, if you want to live in a liberal democracy, to be constantly trying to rebalance trade-offs, often quite tragic. And you need an international order that's congenial to do that, because that's a very difficult process. Liberal democracies are vulnerable. They're more like orchids that need a hothouse or a, a, a greenhouse to, to, to uh, an ecosystem, an environment to live in. And that's the conception. And if you buy that argument of what the challenge is, um, it does come down to rolling up your sleeves, looking for ways to to, to reform liberal democracy, to rebuild uh, uh, the social contract, to reestablish um, a, a kind of consensus on, on, uh, on core values, uh, to, to, uh, to, find, to give and uh, find institutions and policies that, take, that make the system fair and uh, everyday people living everyday lives. That's the, that's the challenge. And uh, so I, I guess that's where, where I am. I, it, all the great eras of international, liberal internationalism, late 19th century, the progressive era, the 1930s and 40s, the great society, each of these moments was not just a moment of internationalism. It was also tied to, to a kind of uh, domestic progressive agenda. So you, ha you can't leave the domestic dimension out. And that is, cl is clearly where I think uh, we, we need to, to go. One final thing, uh, Mick, uh, I don't think it's enough to simply show that liberal democracies have been uh, uh, delinquent uh, uh, and incomplete in their uh, uh, fulfillment of aspirations. Uh, no liberal state has ever acted in international affairs solely on the basis of liberal principles but a liberal international order creates space so that people and groups and movements can struggle to bring their ideals, uh, their the reality closer to their founding ideals. So I, I, it disturbs me when those on the right and those on the left want to sort of say it's over with, it didn't work, it failed, it's built around contradictions, that you are undermining the, the stories the history, the traditions, the partnerships uh, uh, that have provided a basis for an incomplete, but yet uh, important foundation upon which those who want to preserve liberal democracy for, for the 22nd century to have a platform in which to roll up their sleeves and do the hard work. Mm -hmm. Thanks very much, John, John Eikenberry. I'm John Mearsheimer, over to you. and. Interested to hear what you've got to say to the Lenin question and to any of the other points that John and Beata raised. No, I, I'll make three points in response to the what is to be done question. First of all, in, in terms of preserving the liberal international order, as I made clear in my remarks, that's impossible. The liberal international is finished. Liberal international order is finished in large, plate, in large part because the glacis plates that underpinned it have moved. We're now moving out of a unipolar system into a multipolar system. And you cannot have a liberal international order in a multipolar system in my story. Second point I'd make is when I listen to John talking about the importance of spreading liberal democracy all over the planet, which he thinks should be sort of our principal mission moving forward. I just sort of say to myself, John, first of all, don't you realize that we tried this between 1990 and 2017 when Trump moved into the White House and it was a colossal failure. Uh, but more importantly, don't you understand that the United States is in deep trouble at home, that liberal democracy inside America is in real trouble? And don't you think we ought to be concentrating on the home front and trying to get our own house in order before we go around the world proselytizing to other people and trying to do social engineering abroad? We need to do some massive social engineering at home to fix the situation we now face. Just think about what happened on January 6th. 
And just think about the votes that still were there for President Trump or former President Trump in the impeachment hearings. Just think about how people in the United States are talking about the state of democracy. We're in trouble. And to use Barack Obama's rhetoric, we need to do nation building at home, not being running, not going running around the world trying to fix other people's political systems. My final point is what is to be done? What needs to be done is the United States needs to create a wet a Western, or a, I should say, an American-led bounded order that can contain China. That's what we're gonna concentrate on the years ahead. Great power politics is back on the table. The US-China dyad, so to speak, is gonna dominate international politics moving forward. They're gonna build a bounded order of their own. We're gonna build a bounded order of our own. And those two orders are going to compete. And one really positive aspect of Biden being president in the United States is I believe he will do a much better job than Trump did at putting that bounded order together. Uh, but that is going to be the central focus of international politics moving forward, not spreading democracy around the world. Thanks very much, John. And Beata, over to you. Yes, thank you. Um, I want to uh, reformulate your question, uh, Mick, from what is to be done to what is to be avoided. I actually think that uh, we find ourselves in a situation in which, <laughs> you know, the uh, we're pursuing wonderful uh, goals, uh, you know, is a luxury that we can't really afford. Uh, I think what is to be avoided is further division, uh, the further rise of populism, uh, the, the violence and, and trauma that goes with that because we've been there before and we know uh, to what terrible things it can lead. So that I think is very important. Now, how is that to be done? Obviously, you know, some of these very obvious political and economic divisions that are actually, uh, you know, haunting people and that are undermining the belief in these um, in these liberal values uh, need to be addressed. Right, uh, that is clear. But I think there is something else there, which is which I think we need to face, which is the values that uh, that John Eikenberry that you're uh, talking about and as associating with liberalism, first of all, equality and freedom are not only liberal values. Those kinds of uh, values have been around for a long time. Different people, you know, pick them up and run with them uh, at different times in different ways. But the real problem that we're facing today is that though the meaning of those values has actually been hollowed out. We now have the word freedom in the in the mouth of reactionaries, right? And you know, this is a situation in which we have to think about how we can uh, reestablish something, um, you know, coming close to uh, genu a genuine, uh, um, meaningful way of talking about these kinds of things that gets away from the instrumental use of them, right? That seems to me to be one of the main uh, challenges that we're confronting. Okay, thank you very much, Beata. Now, I, I, as you may imagine, I've already indicated we got, we got a lot of questions out here. So first thing I've got to say, apologies to all those I don't bring in. And I will try and bunch questions together to try, kind of create some coherence to all this. Uh, I love the idea of reframing Lenin's what is to be done as what is to be avoided. It doesn't have quite the same punch as Lenin's original pamphlet of 1902, but I get the point. It's a very important one. Look, I'm going to first of all pick up on the issue. This has been thrown at me or thrown, it's going to be thrown at you now about China. Inevitably, it was bound to come up. Um, John Mearsheimer, you made the point that the United States, the West generally made a massive strategic error by, in a sense, encouraging China's rise on the belief that it would become like us, and that has failed. And the British certainly didn't do that with Germany before the First World War. John, I remember Eikenberry, that is, you, you spoke about 
China quite a lot. I remember in many of the articles you wrote in Foreign Affairs. John Eikenberg, do you think you were now wrong in what you were saying about China and bringing together some other points? And John Mearsheim, do you think you're not far too pessimistic about what you are now saying about China? Because you've all, you've come to the conclusion, John, you don't say it. I mean, I know it's, it's, it's a nuanced position. You don't think China can rise peacefully. And there's an implication there. You always you think that war is at least a possibility. You don't say it's an inevitability. And I'd just like to pick John and John up on that. And I'm going to come to you, Piat, on a question on inequality after that, unless you want to come in on the China question. So, John Eikenberry, don't you think you were far too optimistic on the China question in your earlier writings? I, I, I think, yes, I think that I, I it would, did not predict a kind of Xi, a President Xi move where where the, the, there would be a, a retrograde uh, a movement back to authoritarianism, uh, even a kind of drift towards totalitarianism. I, 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 I don't think the, the, um, the, 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 the uh, leaders in the 1990s expected that uh, it would be a kind of uh, transformation, a kind of uh, convergence, a kind of Monticello in Beijing kind of phenomenon. But I, I, I do think that in the end, you need to look at what our choices were and are at these various moments along the way. And I just think that that uh, um, John uh, Mearsheimer is is just it's a kind of a, um, grand delusion to think that in the 1990s the United States could have stepped forward and say we are going to have a grand strategy dedicated to keeping. China under our boot. We're going to put its throat on our, our boot on its throat. We're going to keep China weak, poor, hungry, peripheral, outside of the only international order that now exists, uh, the Western liberal order. Um, uh, how sustainable is that? How could you sustain that in liberal democracies where you are arguing that there is a kind of open uh, evolutionary prospect, a kind of promise for a, for a cooperative international order that can involve countries that are making, and in that early period, China was making reform movements toward greater openness and, uh, and integration, um, I think we would be forever uh, uh, frightened by our efforts to keep China down. Because how do you ever stop that? How do you ever take your boot off China's throat? You are going to forever be at, the, at a moment that, that um, Pericles was in the in the Peloponnesian War, where, where he said, "Our empire has now become a tyranny. It may have been a mistake to take it. It is now dangerous to let it go. We will have generated the kind of enmity that would have uh, created the blowback of the 21st century if we had said, "You're not welcome. You can't come in. You're going to be weak, poor, hungry, and peripheral." I think we had to work with China. I, I still think we have to work with China, but the good news is that J John is doubly wrong because he's wrong as well that, that liberal international order can't be viable if it's not global. Uh, that's a kind of conceptual trick. And I, this is kind of that Marshall McLuhan moment in Annie Hall where the one who first used the term inter liberal international order steps forward and say, say, no, you don't know what the term means. It's not global. It, it, it's it's a group of liberal democracies that that organize themselves in ways that we describe as as liberal. Uh, that's never been fully global. There there are the, the, there have been aspirations for it to be global, and we, in an era where there is a rising China, you want more liberal internationalism, not less, among those countries that want a set of values to be safeguarded uh, in the wake of the rise of a country that has a very different vision of international order. So uh, it's not about spreading democracy to distant shores. Some liberals have wanted to do that, but that's not the essence. It's making the world safe for democracy. Safety is the word. Creating conditions so that you can safeguard your democracy in a world of tyranny, intolerance, and violence. Uh, and in that dangerous world, liberal democracies have to hang together. Thanks, John. Over to John Mearsheimer. John, response, please, and your own points. Yeah, sure. Uh, look, John Eikenberry was clearly wrong. Uh, and his basic argument throughout the 90s and the early 2000s uh, 
was not one that said, we just have to accept the inevitability of Chinese growth and there's nothing we can do about it. And there's a serious chance it may become a potential peer competitor. That's not what he was saying. He was telling the happy story that all liberal internationalists tell, which is that if we integrate China into the liberal international order, we get it hooked on capitalism, we make it a responsible stakeholder in various international institutions, it will democratize. And because democracies never fight other democracies, we'll all live happily ever after. Well, he was wrong. It didn't turn out that way. And the consequences of this are truly dire. The United States of America is now facing a potential peer competitor like it's never faced before. We are in a really dangerous situation. A good realist like me would never think of turning another country into a potential peer competitor. You cannot know when you help a country grow what its intentions will be 10, 15, 20 years down the road. But he was confident, as were the vast majority of Americans, including people in the American National Security Establishment, that we could make this work. Well, it didn't work, and we are in deep trouble now. Now, he says there was nothing we could do to prevent that. I don't think that's true at all. I think the United States could have begun to contain China in the late 1990s, and we could have gone to considerable lengths uh, to do certain things to slow down its economic growth. And the most obvious example of this is admitting it into the WTO. We admitted it into the WTO as a developing country. We let it exploit the rules of the WTO, and this country has grown like topsy. This is insanity. No one with uh, uh, a realist bone in his or her body would have ever done anything like this. It was done by good old fashioned liberals. Now, this leads to the question you asked me, Mick, am I being too pessimistic here? Mm -hmm. Let's hope that I'm wrong and John's right. Okay, Let, let's be clear on that. I hope that I'm wrong and I hope that John is right, that it's all gonna work out in the end and he's gonna be able to point a finger at me and say, I told you so. I hope that happens, but I would not bet a lot of money on that. And in fact, I think the security competition between the United States and China is actually going to be more dangerous than the security competition between the United States and the Soviet Union during the Cold War. And that's largely for geographical reasons. As two old dogs like you and I, Mick, remember, the Cold War was centered on the central front, the inter-German border, right? You had two massive armies on either side of that border armed to the teeth with thousands of nuclear weapons. It was almost impossible to imagine a war starting between the Warsaw Pact and NATO simply because it would have ended up with everybody getting vaporized and nobody wanted that for obvious reasons. If you look at the geography in the US-China competition, there's no equivalent of the central front. The potential points of conflict are the South China Sea, the East China Sea, uh, Taiwan, and possibly the Korean Peninsula. And with regard to those first three points of conflict, you can easily imagine the United States and China ending up in a shooting war in the South China Sea or over Taiwan. I'm not saying that's likely, I'm just saying that's much more likely than a war on the central front during the Cold War. So I'm actually very nervous about the possibility of this intense security competition turning into a real shooting war. And I think the United States and the Chinese will have to go to great lengths moving forward to manage this competition so that that doesn't happen. Thanks very much, John. I, I love being called an old dog. I don't mind at all, but thank you. Uh, Beata, I don't know if you want to unmute, Beata. You are muted, please. Thank you. Great. I don't know if you want to come in on the back of that, because I do have another, another question. You, moving away from the states, or the two states we're talking about, largely the United States and China, moving, in a sense, back to the domestic, where I think some of your comments were directed. I've got a, a question here. It, it partly touches on inequality, and there's been a number of those on inequality, but also you, you, I think neither John 
or John, if I might say so, talked about populism. You mentioned it. I wonder if you could, because there's a question here from Frank Hardy. Thanks, Frank. Really asking about populism. I mean, is it is it, is it a spent force now? Is it just a, 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 a dead dog this time? Or does it really have legs? Sorry to keep using all these analogies, but, um, and, and in a way, what can be done to deal with it? And is addressing inequality the main way of dealing with it? I know that's a large general question, Beata, but I thought that'd be one that you would like to address and maybe, maybe talk about. Maybe John and John would like to follow up as well, but let's start with you, Beata, on that one, if I might, please. Thank you. Okay. Um... I don't think that populism is a spent force. I think this is there. I agree with John Mearsheimer on this. You know, we just have to see how many people are still <laughs> voting for Trump. And of course, we mustn't be only concentrated on the Western world either. You have populists in India, in Brazil, in, Orca, in Turkey, in all kinds of other places. This is a much broader phenomenon. And, and for it, of course, also a much more dangerous one. Um, it seems to me. So I don't think it's a spent force, unfortunately. Um, mm. I, think, I think it's fed by inequality, economic inequality, but also by political inequality, by systems that promise you have a voice when actually you don't, right? When whatever you, you're voting for is not going to make a difference to the main policies to which your particular state has uh, committed uh, themselves. Um, I think it's very dangerous when people are being kept out. The, you know, I think the privatization of education in, in all the different forms in which it occurs and, and, and the whole issue of intellectual property rights and knowledge production and all of this kind of stuff is really, really important uh, for undermining any kind of genuine value um, in, in the way in which we're thinking and talking. You know, we're feeding, um, I think, conspiracy theories. Um, if, if, if knowledge, truth, things like that are, are just simply to be sold to the highest bidder. And um, in all kinds of contexts, of course. Uh, so I would, you know, I, I think those issues need to be addressed. I don't actually, I'm not particularly uh, optimistic that they are being addressed because I don't think that the pressure on these states at the moment is, is big enough yet. Yeah, I don't see Joe Biden uh, going to do radical policy changes. There is nothing particularly radical about the man. I, I'm very glad he's there, but you know, <laughs> and, and the same goes for a lot of other, what one might call liberal leaders um, who are not going to do this. So, so I'm rather frightened that, um, that not much is going to be done and something, um, you know, has to go more fundamentally wrong before people may see the light. And this brings me back to something that uh, John Eikenberry said at the very beginning in his talk, which is, you know, the, the crises that liberalism has sort of weathered over the years. These crises, of course, in many ways, I would argue were homemade crises. But apart from that, the reason why it weathers these crises is because when the pressure gets too big, like, for example, in the Second World War and all that goes with it, then you come up with a, another form of liberalism, embedded liberalism with more, you know, social equality and so on and so forth, which is fine, right? But, but that only happens under force, under pressure. And at the moment, I don't yet see that pressure. So that's, that's my fear. Thanks very much, Biard. It's very interesting to, if one thinks of one of the great agencies of social change and social progress, ironically, it was World War II in terms of transforming the world and transforming social relations in the United States and elsewhere. Not that we're advocating another war in order to kind of sort out our problems, but uh, it, it is worth, if we're thinking historically, as you all have, then looking back to the consequence of World War II, other than just its humanitarian catastrophe, some of the consequences in the long term, to, to use our, our phrase, you know, did have some consequences which were not entirely negative in terms of creating that liberal world order, according to John Eikenberry, many, many other things. We've been talking a lot about uh, the North, really, the global North, if I might say so, not just great powers, but other powers in the North. We haven't touched on European Union, 
and I've had one question from Ted Barnett, which I'll try and get to on, on Europe. What, what, where does Europe fit into this scheme? Because we talk a lot about the USA and China. Where does Europe fit into this? And I'll ask that of the two Johns. But, but also a more general question to all three of you, really. What about the Global South? I mean, was that the great beneficiary of the liberal international order you, you, you celebrate, John, and talk about so, so coherently? Um, was it a victim of this liberal international order? Was it a beneficiary? Uh, how, how do you think the Global South now looks on globalization? Globalization is much criticized in the West. I don't find so many criticisms of globalization, so many at least, in countries which have benefited from globalization over the last 15, 20 years, including, by the way, China, uh, where, where you hear quite a lot of celebration of globalization. I know there's a rambling kind of point, a rambling kind of question, but just like take your first point on, on the global south. Where does it fit in and where do you understand it? I'll, I'll start again with John, John Eikenberry, then move across. Sorry, one, two, three, John. Well, liberal internationalism as a way of looking at and acting in the world, uh, as I've been describing it today, uh, has been on, on both sides of the great question of, of how how uh, the Western world has dealt with the non-Western world and how the North has dealt with the South. On, on the one hand, the 20th century was in some ways a struggle over what, the, what kind of international order would we have? Would it be based on empires or nation states? World War I and, wor and even more so World War II was in some sense a, a war about that, at least indirectly. And uh, the, the the U.S. certainly by the time of Roosevelt and the post-war era was was plunking down in in, in favor of a world of, of nation states, self-determination, uh, uh, tied to sovereign equality and the United Nations and universal style principles for participation in the order. And all of that uh, uh, gave impetus to uh, a, grand movements for self-determination and national liberation. Uh, and, and in some ways, in the struggles today, which have been over how do we uh, provide greater opportunity and, and al allow uh, our, our friends and neighbors in the South greater access to the technologies and, and resources and, and opportunities of development, uh, at the very least, you want to preserve some kind of international order that's dedicated to a kind of multilateral, open, rule of law uh, uh, kind of framework. If we uh, give up on that, we will, and certainly, and John thinks we're already on that path to, to a kind of world of, 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 of breakdown of zones, of, of spheres of influence, a kind of return of, of realist uh, a fragmentation, multipolar, all about security, not about a kind of global construction of common space for mutual opportunity. In other words, liberal internationalism. So I, 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 if you want more, you've got to save what you've got. So that, that would be my, my first, my first uh, 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 argument. Um, and uh, like I suggested before, I, I think um, the the, the, the only way in which we can uh, save that kind of fragmentary aspects of the order that, that has provided great, uh, great accomplishments in the past, economic and security and so forth, is to, is to, is to build it around like-minded like countries. There is a new set of countries out there that are mostly liberal democratic in one way or another that want some kind of open system. Uh, some people call them conservative globalizers to think of India in that regard or Brazil or more multilateral middle state countries, Australia, which is very horrified by China in uh, Canada, which wants to preserve a multilateral system. There is a coalition of countries. It's not simply US versus China. There is a group of countries that want to, to rebuild and refashion a kind of open liberal international order. There's an alliance of multilateralism, 50 countries. The most eloquent person I heard talk about a kind of reformed open liberal order was the foreign minister of South Korea. If ever there's a country that has been a beneficiary of a kind of uh, 
75 year liberal international system, it's, 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 it's South Korea, which has, which allowed it uh, uh, the opportunity and, and space for making these transitions a, a, away from uh, military, military authoritarianism towards capitalism, towards democracy. It wants now to be a kind of middle state player, not simply focused on the Korean peninsula. So there is a new set of coalitions out there, alignments that are waiting to be tapped by the next generation of liberal democratic order builders. Now, Ms. Shima. Yeah, I want to answer the question about the EU and Europe and how it fits no, in the China competition. And I'd be yeah. very curious what Beata has to say about the points I make. Uh, I think that when you envision the United States containing China, uh, that containment policy will have two dimensions to it, a military dimension, which is what we focus on most, and an economic dimension as well. And in fact, if you look at what Trump was doing vis-a-vis -vis China, you could see that his policy of containment had a heavy dose of economic uh, policy making. Uh, now, with regard to Europe, Europe is not going to be of any use to the United States for purposes of containing China militarily. Uh, the military containment of China is going to involve a balancing coalition that involves countries like India, Vietnam, South Korea, Japan, Australia, so forth and so on. Uh, the Europeans don't have the power projection capability or really the interest in deploying large numbers of military forces uh, into East Asia uh, for purposes of containing China. Where the Europeans come into play is on the economic dimension. And you mm -hmm. can already see this with all the discussions about 5G. There's no question, in my opinion, that moving forward, the Americans will try to slow down Chinese economic growth. And they'll be especially concerned about uh, high-end technologies. And the Americans will put pressure on the Europeans not to trade certain goods with the Chinese and in effect, not to feed the beast from the American point of view. And of course, the Chinese will go to great lengths to encourage economic intercourse with Europe. And the Europeans will have all sorts of economic incentives to trade with China. Mm -hmm. And they won't have to worry about China as a security threat because the United States will be doing the heavy lifting along with our Asian allies on that particular dimension of the policy. So I think there's a real potential for trouble on this front. And I think that over time, the key issue is whether or not this will poison US-European relations to the point where the Americans take their troops and go home. Europeans would really like the Americans to stay. They see the United States by and large as a pacifier and they don't want the Americans to go home. But the Americans have strategic incentives to take their troops out of Europe and concentrate them in East Asia or even in the Persian Gulf where they're gonna be dealing with the Chinese threat front and center. So there's a strategic imperative to pull those troops out. And what I'm saying is if EU relations with China begin to blossom, it's likely to poison European, American or transatlantic relations. And the Americans are then likely to move their military forces out of Europe, which is something I don't think the Europeans want. Okay, thanks, John. I've got something to say on that, but I won't because I want to go over to Beata. Beata. Okay, I have to, uh, I have to disappoint you, John. Uh, I, I really, I, I can't fathom this whole European thing. <laughs> I mean, as in, I can't predict, you know, how the, I think you're overall, you know, uh, uh, laying out what it looks like. Uh, yeah, it's not, it's, it's pretty much spot on, but how it's going to develop, I don't have a clue. Um, hmm. I wanted to come back to the, uh, to the question about the global south. Um, yeah, great. I think the, you know, I've obviously uh, different countries in the global south have made very different experiences uh, in, if we're talking about the liberal world order since the end of the Cold War, uh, some of them, you know, quite positive, others not so much. Um, I also think we really have to distinguish between 
the state and the people, right? Because it's not always the case that because the state seems to be successful, the people also are <laughs> and vice versa. Um, but on the whole, my uh, impression is that countries in the global South have very much lost faith in, 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 the, liberal <laughs> in the liberal world order and the liberal way of doing things. Um, because they were, of course, bearing the brunt of all these contradictions uh, throughout that period. And, um, and I'm wondering, you know, whether during the Cold War, because I'm wondering whether a multipolar order provides uh, weaker countries with a little bit more room for maneuver with a little bit more room to experiment politically, economically, and so on, as was the case during the Cold War. Mm -hmm. Obviously, because of the different spheres of influence, that was also dangerous. But in as much as you don't have the Global South sort of divided up clearly into spheres of influence, it could be that uh, a multipolar order is actually helpful uh, for people in the Global South in that it allows them to potentially um, more, you know, to, to, to fashion their policies more in terms of what the local mm. needs and, and desires are. I could just jump in on that and then maybe bring that question back to John Mearsheim, if I might, John. I mean, the question of military containment of China is one thing, but if we kind of think of the, the current world order, whether we call it multipolar or even bipolar, it doesn't really matter for the moment, I think Biard has made an extraordinarily good point, namely that if we see what's happening in the world today, those who could benefit from this less unipolar world, if I can put it in that rather awkward way, are going to be countries in the South. And look at Africa today, a number of African countries are clearly benefiting from it, exploiting the contradictions between the West, the United States on the one side, and China on the other. And China has kind of stepped in there quite reasonably, I think you would say, as an inspiring rising power. They're only doing what everybody else has done in the past. So therefore, within this world order, certain countries, certain parts of the world may indeed benefit John. John Mearsheim, what do you think about that, John? Two quick points, Mick. Yep, One please, is, yeah. I think the Chinese are essentially imitating the United States <laughs> in terms of their foreign policy or sure. their grand strategy. So I agree with what you said there. Second point, I think there's no question uh, that in a bipolar world like the Cold War, as Beata said, that countries have an opportunity to play the U.S. off against the Soviets. And in a multipolar world where you have three or more great powers, three in this particular case, mm -hmm. the opportunities to play countries off against each other are even greater. Mm -hmm. And the place where you're going to see this big time, and you already see evidence of it, is in the Middle East, and you see it with Iran. I just read today where the Iranians are doing military or naval exercises with the Russians. The Chinese are becoming quite close to Iran, right? Mm -hmm. So Iran, which feels ostracized by the United States, is therefore moving to have closer relations with both Russia and China. Even Saudi Arabia has begun to warm up to the Chinese. And of course, this will give Saudi Arabia and Iran leverage with the United States. Uh, so we should see much more of that. You're going to have a more dynamic world uh, as we move from unipolarity to multipolarity. And here's the last question, because we're coming up to about 25 past the hour. And it's to all three of you, because I wanted to ask this question much earlier. And there's a lot on this from the chat line, which is about COVID. I think we've got to talk about COVID. It's one of the reasons we're here today online is because of COVID. Um, and China comes into this as well, both John and, and Beata, doesn't it? China is winning the COVID war, is it not? I mean, China is also using vaccine diplomacy, as indeed is Russia. But I want to ask a more general question as to where you think this pandemic, not where does it end, because it will end one day like all oh, conflicts, I suppose, end or wars end, as Freddie Clay once said many years ago. But what impact do you think this is going to have, this kind of unforeseen or maybe predicted pandemic? It's shattering the world. It's reduced world trade by nearly 28 percent, nearly 30 percent. It's killed millions of people. It's going to kill a lot more people as we go forward. And the rates of deaths 
uh, in the United States and the UK have been especially high and in Europe too, but you know. So what overall impact do you think this, this appalling human tragedy is going to have on, 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 on your general theory of international politics, John Mearsheim, Eichenberg Berry and Biada, or more generally on the world as you see? It? I'll start again with John Eichenberry, John Mearsheim, and then let Biata conclude, and then we'll have to go offline just about 27, 28 minutes past. So I'm not giving you very long. John Eikenberry, if you could finish, John, that'd be great. Thanks, Mick. Great last question. And just uh, thank you to my panelists as well, colleagues, mm -hmm. uh, for a great discussion. I don't come to this discussion with a theory about the future. I, I don't know. I, I could imagine many different futures. My, I don't have a deterministic uh, theoretical framework. Uh, it sort of uh, reminds me of the old phrase by Isaiah Berlin, you know, history has no libretto. Uh, uh, there are lots of different possibilities, lots of moving parts. I do think that the COVID has has uh, re has has kind of shattered and reformed our global imaginaries. Uh, mm -hmm. That uh, th that uh, liberal democracy is more fragile than we thought. That uh, that there are costs for failed international cooperation. Uh, that. Um, uh, that we, there is a kind of common fate uh, of, of, of mankind, uh, that science and enlightenment era civilization uh, is, 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 is weaker than we may have thought in, in the heyday of, mm. of the kind of rise of liberal democracy. If you I, could be I, quick, John, because I want to bring things to an end very quickly. Yeah, so I, I think that, uh, that if, 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 to the extent we are kind of living through a period like the 1930s, the first movement is kind of a Kind of a nationalist backlash, mm. but in the longer term, we we see the deep uh, interconnections that mm. that uh, interdependence is is something that that the solution set for mm. cascades of, of of modernity driven interdependence is more, not less, uh, mm. a collaborative uh, uh, order building, and that for me, I think, will be the longer term Good. impulse. Thanks, thanks, John. And, and, and it's classical liberal answer, if I might say, but not very mm -hmm. one too. John Mearsheimer. I think there's no question that COVID is an appalling disaster around the world, but I think it's going to have little, hardly any impact over the long term, much like the 1918 influenza. The 1918 influenza yeah. had hardly any impact on international politics and in the 1920s and 1930s. It's not gonna change the balance of power in any meaningful way, not change domestic political systems in any meaningful mm. way, not change ideologies in any meaningful way. Mm. Uh, so it, it's in terms of the long-term not gonna matter. Okay, John, that's a very clear trenchant uh, response to that. Beata, uh, I owe yeah. it a lot for the last point, thanks. Yeah, um, well, if you believe the scientists, and this is actually not such an exception, that the exception is that it came so late. Um, so if, if you follow that, then you have to say, what are the, the, the short-term responses to, the, to this kind of thing? Uh, more nationalism, more borders, all of these kinds of things. In, in as much as uh, there is uh, collaboration, and of course there is also collaboration. So at the moment, it seems mm. to me it's, it's really rather on the bumpy side. Mm. Um, and yeah, it, it's not looking so brilliant, I think. It's not looking so brilliant. Okay, three, three answers to that one last question, but I thought I really did want to bring it in. Firstly, I'd like to thank all three of you for making your contributions, uh, talking to each other, and uh, indeed answering all the questions very, very, very well indeed, if you don't mind me saying so, but you did. Uh, I'd also like to say uh, thank you to all the 1,500 people we had out there online and many more thousands, no doubt, uh, in, uh, in, in, in the social space of Twitter and, and elsewhere. This will be coming across also as a podcast, I'm very pleased to say. Last but by no means least, I'd like to thank the LSE and the IR department and also ask you to look at their webpage uh, to see upcoming upcoming meetings and also look at the LSE because we've been hosting an enormous amount of public events which has been attended by literally hundreds of thousands of people around the world so no more from me just to say to John, John and Beata thank you again keep well keep safe and I hope to see you soon in the real world thanks again everybody bye bye thank you